welcome all. Um, thank you for joining us uh, uh, for the, the Sibsi Energy Performance Group Power Hour. Uh, my name is Roger Macklin. I'm uh, chairman of the uh, Sibsi Energy Performance Group. Um, I'm a consultant with Hawley. So just a quick introduction to the uh, Sibsi Energy Performance Group. Um, uh, our mission is uh, is described there. I I'm not going to read it because I'm hoping you can all see the text yourselves. Um, uh, it is worth noting that you don't actually have to be a member of SIBSI uh, to join the SIBSI Energy Performance Group, but we would very much like you to do so. Uh, SIBSI is a great organization, lots of really uh, useful information, um, great connection points, and uh, networking, and so on and so forth. Um, but as I say, that this is what the, the, the energy performance group is. Um, uh, we started to run these power hours uh, a little while ago. Um, they've been running for a couple of years now. Um, and the, the whole idea about the power hour is that we, uh, we assemble a, a number of, of uh, leaders in the field of the topic we're talking about. We ask them to speak for a very short period of time. Uh, and, and it's really all to do with encouraging uh, debate and discussion. So I, I would strongly urge you to uh, use the, the chat pane uh, in the conversations. Um, the, uh, the topic of the uh, power hour today is uh, low and carbon, low and zero carbon heat networks. Can it be done? Um, uh, and if I can introduce uh, Helen Gavin, who's going to kind of moderate the, the event today. Um, Helen, Helen is a sustainability professional, uh, many years experience in environmental issues and is particularly passionate about renewable energy and water resources. Thank you very much, Roger. Well, welcome everybody to this event. Uh, now, we like to challenge ourselves and this Energy Power Hour is no exception to that. So as you may deduce from the title, we have one hour and everything needs to happen in one hour. So we have four speakers for you and we also want to cram in a Q&A. Uh, so time is very tight, um, and so in order to have some time for Q&A, we have given our speakers the challenge of speaking for seven minutes on their, their specialist topic. Now, of our four speakers, uh, we have Phil Jones, Bav Patel, Anthony Meanwell, and Henrietta Kukulhin. Our first to speak is Phil Jones. So Phil, can you get ready with your slides, please, while I introduce you? So Professor Phil Jones has over 40 years of experience in decarbonising buildings across the UK and for the last 25 he's been working on heat networks and in the last five focusing on large heat pump schemes. Now Phil is a visiting professor at London South Bank University and currently working on the Green Skies fifth generation scheme in Islington, London. And he is the lead author on the recently published SIBSI CP1 2020 Heat Networks Code of Practice. Phil, are you ready? Heat networks. Um, so I'm only got seven minutes, so I'll go very quickly. I shall power through the hour. Um, heat networks, uh, in my view, and in the government's view, it's in a lot of government documents, are going to be a big part in decarbonising heat in the UK. For those not familiar with heat networks, um, you may have heard them being called district heating. District heating is generally when there are quite a number of buildings from a single energy centre. <coughs> Excuse me, but the uh, you can also have heat networks that are a single block with uh, boilers or CHP or whatever at the bottom of the block, often called communal heating, but both are heat networks. Um, so heat networks often involve putting this sort of stuff into uh, trenches in the road and so on. This is pre-insulated steel pipe work with uh, uh, in, in 10 meter lengths that need welding. So that's the sort of stuff that we're putting in there. Um, we are now starting to define heat networks a lot better. And in CP1, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, we have defined primary, secondary and tertiary parts of the heat network. And so, uh, those can be treated and are often treated in, in somewhat different ways, but they're all part of the heat network. Um, heat networks have, unfortunately, in the past been rather synonymous with this sort of device, CHP. Uh, this is gas-fired engine-driven CHP at King's Cross. Um, 
But this sort of technology, although it's still a good economic winner, uh, it's no longer a carbon saver due to grid decarbonisation, electricity grid decarbonisation. And so a lot of my work over the last five years has been on large scale high temperature uh, heat pumps like the one that you see in front of you. This is an ammonia driven heat pump of about uh, over a megawatt from Star Renewable Energy. So that's where we're heading. Um, where we're also heading is putting down more rules about uh, heat networks. Our new code of practice uh, just recently published, although it's a voluntary code of practice, sets out minimum requirements around uh, heat networks and it's been massively updated. Uh, and we've also in parallel now got a Danish standard uh, on hot water diversity 439 translated into English. Uh, huge success, huge step forward. Um, so you might be familiar from this, with this. This was in the 2015 version, it remains, but we've taken this from 90 pages to 240 pages. So you can see we've really expanded in depth and width, but there's a much greater emphasis on um, compliance with the code. How, you know, uh, does my scheme comply with CP1 or not? But also a much bigger theme right throughout the document on customer satisfaction as well. Now, um, a lot of the heat networks in the UK are what I would call third generation, but fourth generation, 4DHC, is actually uh, coming to the fore, particularly in new build situations. These 4DHC schemes have a single energy centre feeding heat out to buildings, similar sort of approach, but at a lower temperature. Um, and cooling would be a separate system, as, as I've shown in blue there. There's no real interchange of heat between buildings. Uh, so that's fourth generation, or 4G, some people call it, I do, uh, but not telephones. But 5G, 5DHC, uh, is actually a completely different animal. It is often called the ambient loop sort of approach, but it's more a warm header and a cold header, ultra low temperature. Uh, and this is actually decentralized heat pumps, sharing heat and cooling across that ambient loop, uh, but requiring a balancing mechanism uh, and in, our, in most of the cases we're using boreholes, but it does provide much greater opportunity for heat recovery, which I'll mention in a moment. This ambient loop or warm header, cold header could be regarded as a sort of plug and play uh, LAN system where you can come along and plug in a new building that gives much more flexibility for developers. Uh, but also 5DHC is a really good solution where there's a significant cooling and heating demand and you can actually share, often called prosume, prosuming across the heat network itself. One person's heat is another person's cooling. Uh, and I've seen this in practice in Heerlen, in the Netherlands, where they've actually got 20 big buildings on a uh, system like this. This is a picture of one of the plant rooms with uh, heat pumps. Go to this great website in the bottom left hand corner, uh, Midgen Water, Mine Water, uh, some great videos uh, of uh, what they're doing there. Fantastic. It does work. Uh, it's out there. So we have been progressing in terms of heat networks. Most of the schemes in the UK are 3DHC at 80 degrees C above and above. 4DHC is coming to the fore and we are now innovating around 5DHC at probably 14.4 across the, uh, the, the network. I've put in there a, a middle option which is 4.5DHC which is prosuming on the heat pump at the energy centre but you can see 
the gradual progression of heat networks uh, across this. But when I say progression, physically, there is no clear option to turn a 4 DHC into a 5 DHC, very different animals and different uh, layouts. Um, and if you want any more on fourth and fifth generation, go and find this uh, um, uh, roadmap to achieving uh, fifth generation on the Sibzi Technical Symposium website 2019. And I'm currently working on a project called Green Skies. Green Skies is a fifth generation uh, heat network and we've got a consortium of 15 partners led by London South Bank University and London Borough of Islington uh, and actually we've been doing a lot of work around the Islington piece. The red dots that you can see right up and down that was our original, that is still our future plan, our grand plan but because we've lost RHI, Renewable Heat Incentive, we've had to squeeze this down to something that's more investable. Uh, and that is the square box to the right hand side that we're calling the New River Scheme. But that New River Scheme will save 5,000 tonnes of uh, carbon every year. Uh, so a fantastic carbon saver. Um, it is, you've seen this picture a moment ago, but actually to point out the basis of green skies is a great big data center. So we're providing them with cooling. That cooling is giving heat into the warm and cold header that helps heat, uh, that acts as a heat source for all of the other uh, heat pumps. We are calling this a smart local energy system because we're wrapping in electric vehicles, PV and possibly batteries. If you want any more, go to that paper at the bottom. Uh, and just to answer the question on the exam sheet, are low carbon tech net heat networks possible? Uh, yes, particularly for DHC and fifth generation, but the challenge is to make these economic without RHI. And I think we're getting there. Uh, back to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Phil. Now we need to move on to Anthony Meanwell. Uh, Anthony currently works in EON's City Energy Solutions team and one of his responsibilities is looking at how we decarbonise EON's UK district heating schemes. Now before that, Anthony had helped public sector organisations to reduce energy and carbon through energy efficiency projects across their existing estates, so has lots of experience. Anthony, over to you. Thanks Helen. I'm just going to put my little reminder on. <laughs> So I'm going to have to talk very quickly to get through all of my slides in the next seven minutes. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction. I'm then going to talk to you about the city gen decarbonisation journey. Um, and I'm also going to try and answer the question, can we make city gen a low carb, a low stroke zero carbon heat network? Uh, so from an introduction point of view, so I'm Anthony Meanwell. Um, I'm currently the, the decarbonisation lead for EON's um, district heating business, focusing on our existing assets. So we've got 67 uh, district heating schemes uh, across the UK and we are committed to decarbonising our estate. So our largest scheme is CityGen and this is the jewel in our crown, um, but it also emits 20,000 tonnes of CO2 uh, per annum. And the focus of uh, a piece of work we did last year was to see how we could start that decarbonisation journey at CityGen. And as some of my colleagues have put it, is put CityGen on a decarb diet. So for those that don't know, CityGen is uh, located on the edge of the, the city uh, by Farron Tube and it's, it's opposite Smithfield Market. Um, it started off life as a, in the 1890s as a coal fired power station and used to produce electricity for the market and the local area. Uh, it then subsequently became a cold store and you can see the, the middle picture, the Port of London Authority. So that's one of the buildings at CityGen. And in the 80s, the City of London had this great idea to turn CityGen into an energy centre to provide uh, heat and chill into its buildings uh, across the city. Um, and in 1995, CityGen produced its first heat and chill into that network and also produces electricity for um, distribution into the grid. So from a, a network point of view, it now serves not just only the City of London Corporation, but it also uh, looks after private businesses and residential apartments. 
So some of the buildings you might be familiar with, so the Guildhall, uh, Barbican and Smithfield, are some of the large City of London uh, buildings it serves. And when the when the scheme was designed, it was it was quite clever in using tunnels and subways. So rather than having to dig up the road, which is quite expensive, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner picture, uh, we utilise tunnels to to keep those costs down. Now, CityGen is powered by gas boilers, uh, gas CHP, and electric chillers. So that big blue beast you can see um, in the slide is is one of the two CHP engines that sit within CityGen, and it's these that uh, produce nearly all of the CO2 uh, emitted from, from CityGen, some 20,000 tonnes per annum. So when CityGen was was uh, created, it did save carbon. It was much better than the individual boilers in the individual buildings. But now obviously the challenge is how do we de decarbonise what we have, um, whilst also protecting the asset. So those engines were only installed five years ago. So what we did uh, at the start of last year is that we worked with Ramble to create a feasibility study and come up with a solution. And the solution that we ca uh, they came up with was to install a heat pump. So as uh, Phil has just been talking about, four megawatts of heat pumps to be precise, uh, which will be located quite ironically in what is uh, the old CHP engine bay. Um, so that room was left empty for future CHPs. Um, no longer. It will now be filled full of heat pumps. Um, time does move on very quickly. So those are the heat pumps that we install need a low grade heat source. So we've got two of them at CityGen. Uh, one of them will be a renewable source. So we're going to install boreholes. So pitch on the left, nice, looks like a nice quiet street. We're going to put three boreholes. Uh, they will go down to a depth of 200 meters and we will extract water from the, the London aquifer at around 14, 15 degrees. We have a few challenges putting the boreholes in. Um, lots of services uh, in the street, as you can see on the third picture. And once we've got through those services, we have some challenges to uh, go through the arches that sit underneath the street, but it can all be done. We also have waste heat. Um, so CityGen is a third generation heat network. It's powered by CHP, and that has an intercooler that has waste heat that currently just goes to atmosphere. Similarly, the electric chillers that produce uh, the cold water emit waste heat. Um, so we are going to capture that waste heat and we will utilize it and we will heat up the water before uh, the return water to the boreholes uh, so that we, we, we can utilize the waste heat. One of the challenges that we have with CityGen is it uh, supplies old buildings for the City of London. Um, as a result, our temperatures are high, our supply temperatures are high uh, and as our return temperatures and, and Phil mentioned that in his presentation. Um, in order to get our efficiency up on our heat pump, um, then we need to do something to bring down those return temperatures. And we have a number of projects underway uh, where we are going to achieve that uh, to improve the efficiency. So by installing the heat pumps with the boreholes and the waste heat, we will reduce CO2. And the, our model predicts that we will, should reduce CO2 by about 30%. And over a 20 year term, that's about 100,000 tonnes of CO2. Now, there are many factors um, that have an impact on that. And one of the key ones is actually how much water we can extract out of the boreholes. So um, from a business case point of view, uh, we could not have made the business case work for CityGen without the government subsidy of RHI. So as Phil mentioned, that is no longer, uh, hence why you see the rest in peace uh, in the right hand corner. Um, we managed to secure our tariff guarantee before Christmas. Um, so we have uh, a tariff that we can apply um, but we must just make sure that we install the heat pumps, get it commissioned and working by uh, the 31st of March next year. So the plan is that we start construction next month. Uh, it will be ready by October. And if we run this event this time next year, then maybe we can host it at CityGen and you can see the new heat pump. Um, so can we make CityGen a low zero carbon heat network? In a short, yes, but it's a journey. As you can see, we can only do 30% with the work that we've done so far. Uh, there are other things that we can do. Um, we have to tackle uh, the fact that we are connected to old buildings that require high temperatures. So we have to do work uh, on those buildings in order to bring down the return temperature and help us move towards heat pumps. We have to address the gas and electricity inequality. Gas is too cheap, electricity is too expensive. Until we tackle that problem, then we are not going to see the growth that we need. And I do know that that is in hand and we are going to sort that out as a country. And the last one is about concession zones. So whilst 
new buildings may be mandated to connect we have to we have to go further we need to make sure that not just new buildings but our existing buildings are also connected so that we can achieve that of a low zero a low stroke zero carbon heat network no thank you very much it's a brilliant overview next to speak is bav patel so bav currently works for vattenhall heat uk as the head of operational readiness ensuring the performance of the site can be reached through systematic acceptance of assets and delivering on contractual commitments. Previous to Vattenfall, he, was, he worked for seven years at E.ON in a number of positions spanning energy technologies, including fleet-wide operational excellence programs. And he has operational experience of heat network, acceptance and delivering performance improvement modifications. So, Bav, over to you. Thank you, Helen. Um, Welcome all. Um, I will try and um, uh, go through uh, what, what it does actually entail to, to achieve a good performance on heat network. And, and this is uh, purely coming from operational experience and the industry practices uh, that I have been I've been uh, privy to. So um, to give you a bit of a flavor of uh, what Vattenfall is, uh, Vattenfall um, is one of the largest uh, operators and producers of electricity and heat uh, in, in, the, in the European market. Uh, the main markets in which uh, uh, Vattenfall operates in is um, uh, Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark and the UK. Uh, it has about 22,000 employees. It's fairly new to the UK market. It was um, uh, launched in 2018 uh, quite successfully, winning uh, one of the biggest projects that was to come to uh, the private district heating industry, uh, the Brent Cross Town project. Um, and Vattenfall is going to deliver a 4DHC network on that network. Um, Vattenfall is fully owned subsidiary of the Swedish state, um, so the, the king of Sweden is our boss. And uh, finally, um, it currently operates or has 1.7 million connected customers on its heat network. Um, on the picture on the right, uh, with uh, it's, it's just uh, examples of some of the big, large uh, district heating citywide schemes that we, we operate. Uh, for example, at um, Amsterdam, uh, we uh, add around 4,000 new customers on an annual basis, uh, and it's, it's uh, fairly done through uh, energy from raised uh, connections. Um, so in the next um, uh, few minutes, I would want to cover three key areas of, of uh, performance and uh, go back to how we actually measure carbon in our heat networks. Uh, what are the learnings in the design, install and acceptance of heat networks and how does uh, digitalization can play a role in improving car carbon performance of the heat networks? Um, starting off with measuring of carbon, uh, what we have seen in the industry is that um, there, are, there are two different areas on which uh, the stakeholders of heat networks um, draw their um, sources of information from. So when we look at um, the early stages of a project, uh, the councils and the developers and regulatory requirements are focusing quite heavily on the SAP-12 um, and, and the long-term averages using, uh, used in SAP-12 to, to design the heat networks and apply for planning permissions. What then tends to happen is in the in the operational world is that a lot of uh, um, operators have various sources of information on which they base their carbon performances on, and try and run the operates based on these different different sources of information rather than sticking to a single source. Um, what then happens is at the end of the year is that uh, the greenhouse uh, gas company reporting happens through the annual average that the electricity, uh, the, the carbon intensity on the electricity grid was. But there's a clear discrepancy between the planning stages, the operational stages, and then the reporting stages of, of, um, of our heat networks. Um, moving on, um, where, where does the, uh, some of the issues start to, to, to manifest itself um, is, is starting with from a design. Um, so as Phil said that we have now um, uh, translated the Danish standard. Um, we are still using um, non-UK standards and non-UK averages in, in terms of the data. And combining that with the contractual liabilities usually put on design houses, uh, leads to oversizing of our, our networks, which inherently provide uh, higher than the reference case of, of carbon, carbon content within the heat network. Then we move on to how they get delivered and installed. Um, generally, the the new build energy centers, the new build district heating networks are designed and delivered based on their uh, final peak demand. Um, what that leads to is a lot of uh, 
big kit gets put in the energy centers at the start of the start of the uh, network and with the early years of operations with lower occupancy of the flats and further extension of the network the district heating particularly uh, struggles with the, the delta t parameter and finally during the acceptance phases uh, the uh, when when escos or when the operators are accepting those those assets into operations they're very much sort of struggling with sort of getting the identified snags uh, during the construction commissioning phases uh, closed out, uh, essentially due to the time pressures that the main contractors are being put on by, by their developers and the practical completions that they would like to hit. Uh, moving on with the, the digitalization, um, again, this is uh, uh, from a commercial point of view, a lot of Reba 3 designs move into Reba 4. A lot of cost engineering happens at that point um, to achieve the, the, the commercial performance of the project, uh, sometimes leading to cost engineering out a lot of uh, useful data points, sensors and meters. Uh, these sensors and meters play a big role in finding areas of improvement and performance in the future, but because inherently we're not installing them uh, and, and cost engineering them out um, becomes an issue uh, in, in actually monitoring and, and improving performance of the heat networks. Um, there's a legacy issue in our industry regarding the, the automatic meter read um, and, and, and the smart meters or the heat meters sitting in every resident's house. Uh, current uh, heating and billing regulations uh, suggest that, that we have to produce one accurate bill per year. What that often leads to is an industry-wide behavior of um, uh, not being able to fix the AMR in timely manner. And that creates a gap in useful operational data. Once again, that can feed back into our design. And finally, from an industry uh, norm point of view, um, we run our heat networks widely using uh, remote control rooms or remote operations. What that tends to lead is, is uh, um, non-detection and diagnostics of issues. And when there are detection of the um, uh, issues on the network, performance issue on the network, again, that left get, that gets left uh, for a long period of time before they get uh, resolved because of operational network requiring certain planned outages, new investment required from, from uh, pr private uh, um, operators of the network. So how do we move on from here? The, the, there are, I've, I've identified five areas in which we can actually move on. Um, uh, improvement in our design. So. Uh, one of the ways to do that is, is to start using some UK data and an industry-wide sharing of our data. Um, AD is already calling for this, uh, that the, the, uh, the, the uh, industry cooperates and shares data with each other, but it's a highly competitive market, as we all know. Um, second one is around, as I touched on, discrepancy on the carbon measurement and reporting. Let's try and bring some consistency to it and have some contractual implications. So if you don't meet them, the businesses should be penalized or there should be some co contractual uh, implications of that. Digitalization, as I mentioned about cost engineering areas, let's try and have a strike the right balance between additional five, seven percent of capex at the start of the project versus uh, long long term uh, issues on the on the network. Um, then we have uh, improvement in the operations of the heat network. Um, a lot of the heat networks right now are being left to run sort of at, uh, at a standard uh, dispatch protocol. We can do a lot of dynamic dispatching using um, uh, 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 using the carbon intensity on the grid as a live input into operating the heat network such that we are charging our thermal stores at the point when there is a lot of renewables on in the network. Um, and finally, using influencing our customer behavior. So uh, the customer, taking customer away from worrying about heat to sort of starting to use their sort of space heating demand to use that as a battery so that we can charge their homes or heat their homes uh, at the point of non-peak hours within the heat network. And yeah, that's 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 me, Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much. For that. Thank you. We have one more speaker. Um, so we have Henrietta Cook, called Hen for short. So Hen currently works in Bayes' Heat Networks Delivery Unit as a project lead, supporting local authorities with the delivery of feasibility and detailed design studies, mostly in the south of England. Prior to that, she worked in an engineering consultancy uh, on the commercial and financial side of heat networks. She's an accountant by trade, 
and prior to that she had a senior finance role in a large independent renewable energy generator about 120 megawatts of biomass and wind so hen over to you great thanks very much um so thanks yeah really interesting and great to be here today and it's obviously a topic very close to my heart um i'm going to start up front with saying that my answer to the question is a definite yes i think low carbon heat networks are deliverable um, but also, as I think has come up today, and I think we all recognise that there are barriers, um, and I suppose that's where that's where government sits. You know, we're we're trying to devise ways of overcoming these these so called these market failures, um, and to do that in as balanced and equitable way as possible. Um, so I'm going to be um, covering heat and mil heat metering and billing regs as as was advertised, but I also wanted to just give a bit of a wider context um, of, of where where this all sits and outline the direction of travel for for government. Um, so this slide um, is just giving the dis different strands of work within Bayes um, that are supporting low carbon heat networks, um, ranging from um, delivery, uh, for, from development and support of guidance from HNDU, which is where I sit there on the left hand side. Um, we started work in 2013, um, moving across to um, heat networks investment project, HNIP, um, which is a capital investment, capital funding program. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got the metering and billing regs, which is which, which is, uh, I think, as you probably know, is the only um, regulation currently um, in place for heat networks. Um, and then I want to just focus on, on the green bit, um, which is what, what we're starting to call our um, heat networks transformation program. Um, it really is exciting and, and I think it marks a step change in coordinating our support for the rollout of heat networks in the UK. Um, and just to, to, to mention that it also expands not just to um, regulation, uh, which is the market framework and funding, but we're also looking at skills as a recognition there's a skills gap in delivering heat networks. We're also going to be looking at some of the existing networks, which, um, you know, which are not working as best as they could and trying to support those to, to transform efficiency. Um, and we also recognise, obviously, that, um, you know, we can't operate in a vacuum and that, that buildings are absolutely essential part of um, decarbonisation. So we work very closely with MHCLG on building regs to make sure that heat networks are adequately, appropriately reflected in that. Um, and also coming uh, shortly, soon in the, the early part of this year, um, there's going to be an overall heat and building strategy, um, sort of looking at the wider picture and how, how um, heat use is intrinsically linked to buildings. Um, so yeah, so, so the feeling is a definite sense that there's the momentum building around heat networks. I think the next three to five years will be really critical. Um, there's a growing in increase in interest from market players, as we've heard from, from, from colleagues just spoken. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, I think there's, there's a growing recognition that heat networks are a real option for heat decarbonisation. Um, so moving on to the heat metering and billing regs, um, which uh, to just starting to become a bit more technical here. So um, I think as everyone knows, they came out of the Energy Efficiency Directive from the EU. Um, they were enacted in the UK in 2014. Um, they, at the time, they were, they were one of the um, issues with heat metering billing is, is the cost effectiveness. So is it, is it actually cost effective to install um, a meter? Um, a tool was published at the time of the, the regulations, um, but it was deemed not fit for purpose. Um, but, and so that part of the legislation about installing meters was never actually enforced. But that has now changed as of November last year, as, as um, I'm sure many of you will know, and um, uh, the metering is going to become more and more essential. I think it's maybe worth reiterating um, the purpose of the legislation it has sort of three main strands. So um, the first is establishing a detailed picture of heat networks in the UK, and that's through the notification process. Um, that helps inform future policy, knowing where and what the networks are. Um, then, of course, the metering billing itself, but based on consumption and, and the um, understanding that um, that drives energy efficiency and cost savings. Um, and then finally, of course, supporting fair and transparent billing of customers. Um, in terms of the main changes um, that have uh, introduced in November, um, so talking about notifications, that was all. That was always a requirement every four years for um, heat network suppliers to um, notify of us of their existence. Um, but now there's a there's a mandatory template uh, which needs to be completed. Um, 
the other important thing is this concept of um, building classes. So um, each each uh, so he network suppliers will need to determine which building class each of the buildings on their network falls into, and and this will determine whether or not a meter needs to be installed. And the three classes are um, viable, exempt, and open. Where viable is you have to put one in, and that's mostly new build. Exempt is where you don't have to, and that's some existing buildings like um, supported housing or arms house accommodation, that kind of thing. Um, and then the biggest class, which is the most um, challenging, is the open class, um, and that would be the majority of existing buildings. And for those where there's no meter, people have to then do this cost effectiveness test. So that brings in the new tool. Um, as I say, that, that's now up and running um, and been widely tested. Um, and that tool basically um, enables you to balance out um, where the benefits of installing a meter based on assumed energy savings outweigh the cost of installing that meter. If you test, if you show that your building, um, it is cost effective to install a meter, then you're going to have to install them. Um, in terms of timing, the, there is a transitional period through to September 2022. Um, by November of this year, um, all heat suppliers should have determined their building classes and completed the cost effectiveness tests. And by September next year, they must have actually complied with all the, all the amended regs and the new requirements. So they must have installed those meters. Um, so I'm going to move on from that because I think my time is running by. Um, just going, going back to the sort of the wider picture, I just wanted to touch on the market framework. As I say, I, I won't dwell on this, but just to say we consulted on it last year. Um, it, basically, it's recognising that, you know, heat networks are a monopoly supply. There's a, certainly a role for consumer protection. There's also a lot that can be done to increase investor confidence. Um, so, yes, we consulted last year. Um, the next stage is primary legislation um, with an aim to have heat network regulation in place in 2022. Um, one of the aspects of that that we're also consulting on this year is zoning, uh, which addresses, I think it was Anthony's point about um, concession zones, just, just trying to come up with a way of um, encouraging existing buildings to connect. Um, the other piece of work that is currently underway, again, very relevant to today's discussion, is um, the Green Heat Networks Fund. Um, this is new capital funding. Um, which will replace the Heat Networks Investment Project, HNIP, which, is, which um, finishes in March this next year. Um, and it's got a particular focus on decarbonisation of heat networks. So a recognition that a lot of existing networks, as has already been talked about, um, are fueled by gas, gas CHP, um, and that there are lower carbon ways to, to, to supply heat. Um, so the funding will be applying to new and existing heat networks, public and private sector. Um, the scheme design is underway. The consultation is out at the moment and closes at the end of this month. I would really welcome anyone, um, if you haven't already reply, responded or looked at it, please do. The more, the more input we get from industry, um, the better. Um, and the targeted launch is April next year. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to close there. Um, touched an awful lot of subjects, um, but hopefully that gives you a taster. Thank you very much, Hen. And that concludes our presentation. So, so there have been many questions posted into the chat pane. Um, I'm going to just lead on one question, uh, which is to Phil and Anthony, which is, could fifth generation heat networks help decarbonise CityGen? Do you want to answer that, Phil, or do you want me? Uh, you, you go first. OK. So, yeah, we've been... We've certainly seen within our Swedish and German uh, operations uh, where we have a lot more district heating schemes than in the UK. Uh, fifth generations piggyback quite nicely um, off uh, third and fourth generation district heating schemes. As Phil mentioned uh, when he went through his slides, you need a balancing system in fifth generation. Um, and, you know, using the return lag of, of, the, of the hot network or more predominantly the return lag of the cooling network that can be used as the as the required balancing unit for the fifth generation. So it's a way of extending your existing network. It's not it's not necessarily getting rid of the of the gas that's powering that existing network, but it does allow you to extend it and um, and deliver low, lower carbon heat and chill. So it's a contributing factor. It's another step on the journey. So I think in terms of uh, 
converting 3G into 4G, that's certainly possible, but actually for, for th 3 and 4G into fifth generation is very difficult, different animal, but you can, as Anthony's pointing out, connect all of those systems. And indeed in the green sky system, we are possibly looking at the potential to supply into the Bunhill hot network, as it were, hot in the sense of 80 degrees C. Uh, and so that sort of connection uh, is certainly possible and could be used to help decarbonize the 3G systems that we've, we've got mo mostly in, in the UK. Thank you. Thanks. Question to Hen, and picking up what some of the other speakers have said about the need for subsidy or support, uh, and then on top of that, the disparity between electricity prices and gas prices because of the, the greater uh, imposition of levies, social and environmental levies on electricity bills. What role do you see for carbon taxes and levies in transforming heat networks and making them more viable? Um, there's nothing in place that I that that, uh, that on, on the horizon currently. I mean, the, the the focus for funding for heat networks is very much on capital funding, um, and that's um, looking to address um, obviously getting the pipes in the ground and and the the, the high upfront capital costs. Um, in terms of um, gas and electricity, I mean, it's absolutely recognised that there's an imbalance there. Um, I think. I probably have to slightly step back and say, wait for the heat and building strategy to come out and wait. There's, there's a lot going on that's, um, that is about to be uh, talked about and announced and made public, but um, uh, I have, can't give anything definitive right now on that. Oh, you must be able to share a little snippet. <laughs> we, won't, we won't tell anybody. Okay. My life's not worth it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I have a question for you. Uh, so in your presentation, you mentioned reporting for operational stage when discussing carbon factors. What reporting requirements exist? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's I think um, uh, that I, I think that question was answered earlier. It's quite voluntary oh. right now and it's, 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 oh. usually, it's usually done through sort of voluntary means on, on uh, at the end of the year. Uh, performance on on carbon, and then there should be some um, contractual obligations between the ESCO and the developer that they are working with in terms of uh, reporting on how what was the actual carbon performance of the network. But there's a it's, it's it's a lot of voluntary versus um, uh, uh, compulsory kind of reporting that is that that is going on right now in the industry. Yeah, and so it's a bit loose, and that's not very effective. And there are yeah. numerous stories of where not just heat pumps, but uh, energy efficiency um, things, assets have been put in place and don't always perform and nobody really checks them. So picking up on the recommendations that you made on your last slide, mm -hmm. how do you see this changing? Is it so mandated of, regulations? Sorry, go on. One of the ways we are doing in Vattenfall is we, are, we have been quite upfront about this with our with our developer at Brent Cross Town. Uh, we have put that as a KPI under the contract. And if we don't meet the carbon intensity requirement of the network, there are contractual uh, implications where button file can be booted out, for example. So we are very upfront about being open and honest about actual carbon performance of the heat network with our developer. Okay. So Helen, can I come in? Please do. Please do. Uh, the new update to CP1, the code of practice, does actually set out a lot, lot more reporting, uh, not just to the client, but actually to customers as well. Uh, back to that customer satisfaction I talked about. Um, but of course, as, as Bav is saying, it is still a voluntary code of practice, but if a client developer takes it on board, then they should be doing an awful lot more reporting now. And I'm hoping that CP1 will fall into and underpin some of that regulatory framework that Hem was talking about in the not too distant. Yeah, so in, in the um, consultation document for, for the market framework, there is there is um, some th thought about um, mandating decarbon decar um, declarations by heat network operators. Um, 
so it'd be interesting to, I don't know what, we're, we're analysing responses to that right now to see how far to go on that. But I think one of the big challenges with all this carbon reporting is making sure that every, all the different systems interact because there's, there's so many different impetuses in carbon reporting that we're all aware of. And I think you don't, don't just want another add another layer of that, to that complexity. So I think there's a bit of thinking to go through to how to make sure that whatever is done makes sense in the context of what already exists. I mean, your slide you had, Bav, really demonstrated that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Question to Anthony. That was a quickie one. For the boreholes you're seeking for CityGen, do you need an abstraction license? Do you have a drought plan? Do you need to be mindful of any potential water shortages? Um, okay. Yeah. So, yes, you have to get an abstraction license from the Environment Agency, um, which we have. Um, so, we're not taking water out of the ground. And keeping it out of the ground we're putting it back it's the heat that we're taking out of the water um and the level of the thames aquifer the london basin in that area is good um so no we don't see there being any particular issues in terms of of water levels there and, and that's confirmed by the discussions that we've had with the environment agency so uh, we don't need a drought plan um the drought plan is if it's not running if we don't have the water we can't run the heat pumps and obviously we have backup at the minute but we we don't see that as an issue and that's uh and for other schemes that we're looking at as well, uh, across this, then you know the, the water levels are good in the area. Okay, so it's good here. It's a closed system. You're not abstracting. You're just extracting the heat from it. So yeah. Yeah. So whatever we take out is going straight back in, uh, just colder. And that's why I think Roger asked a question about: Is it um, would it be better to use the waste heat from the intercooler and the electric chillers and and put it somewhere else? We we have total flexibility, Roger. Uh, with the scheme in terms of where we do put the waste heat so we can either warm up the return water going into the aquifer uh, to keep the environment agency happy so we don't cool down the aquifer uh, or we can put it into um, different parts of the system as required. Okay well, actually can I just keep you speaking a bit longer to pick up a question that's just been put into the chat pane uh, which is are you impacted by tideway dewatering at present? Uh, not at present Although um, we might be using somebody to drill the boreholes that's involved with the tideway dewatering, so hopefully they uh, they won't limit the resource that we need to drill ours. But okay, um, oh, we we are running out of time, but we have uh, some time for a few more minutes for a few more questions. So Phil, um, have a question here: Do fifth generation network efficiencies force building occupiers to have specific heating or cooling demands, and will it be difficult to achieve flexibility for future changes in heating or cooling? Uh, there's no sort of restriction on the heating and cooling demand. Um, if you want, you can leave your, and it's advisable, leave your boilers and chillers in as backup. Um, in general, on a fifth generation scheme, the scheme operator will take control of the heat pump. But yeah, you'll get all your heating and cooling demand uh, supplied. I think I think the only thing it does do is um, each individual building will have potentially its own heating and cooling requirements and, and temperatures. So if it's an old building with requirement for high temperatures, then it will need a, a higher t a heat pump that can achieve those higher temperatures versus a modern building which can operate at lower temperatures, can perhaps operate with a, um, a different kind of heat pump that might be more cost effective. I think that's fair to say, Phil. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. Um, and I think Lucy's asked about uh, opening up new markets. I think that 5G or 5DHC could potentially open up new markets. And I mentioned in my one of my slides, I look at this as a sort of LAN that allows developers to come along and actually plug and play a new development onto it. I think that could actually widen the heat networks market very considerably. Um, can we pick up on the, the notion of cooling, though, because we talk about heating, uh, but the need for cooling in the future is becoming ever more present and we have increasing uh, frequency and duration of heat waves in the UK. So is cooling something that is uh, equally considered or is it just the heating aspect? No, it's totally considered. And it, yeah. And it's, yeah. Sorry, Phil. 5G is about sharing heating and cooling. So we're sharing three megawatts of cooling that comes out as heat into the network with 
all of the other buildings on the network that are being heated. So we're sharing heating and cooling. The more you prosume, have that balance, the better. It's yeah. a great way to provide cooling. It's yes. almost like free cooling from the heated buildings. Yeah. So, so the key is, is the key is getting a when you when you're creating a fifth generation network is to try and get that balance between heating and cooling. So you know if you've got a data center that's got a lot of waste heat, then capture it. You know similarly if you've got a an office that uh, needs cooling and heating, then utilize that waste heat from the cooling in the building first. Yeah, so you're not wasting. If it can't be used by that building, then share it using the network with others on the network that need the heating. Um, and so we, I think it, it requires us as, as operators to become a little bit more creative in terms of the different organizations that we get involved with the network. And that for me is where concession zoning and mandating is really going to help. Yeah. Uh, there was a comment from Roger in the chat to pick up that while uh, the designers and operators and implementers of heating schemes are considering this, maybe government isn't. Uh, so we are now at three minutes to the end of our session. So I just want to actually ask the speakers if there's any particular point they would like to make before we wrap up, either to emphasize what you've already said or to answer a question that's been put in the chat and we haven't addressed. Who would like to go first? Uh, Andy's asking me where you get CP1, mm -hmm. and you get it on the SIBSI website, uh, but he's now saying uh, it, they can't find it, but it's there, I managed to download it, but don't forget, there are some checklists that come with it, and they are compliance checklists, and they are fundamental to CP1. Um, can I check your next? Um, yes, please. I just just like to um, say reiterate. You know, there's, is, is we're we're heading into a really transformatory stage for heat networks, and we really really welcome, genuinely welcome feedback from industry. Um, certainly, well, um, the, the, the consultation that's open at the moment is the Green Heat Networks Fund. But genuinely, please do get in touch if you have specific issues or stuff like that. We we really do want to hear from you. So, um, yeah, it's an exciting time. I can go next. Uh, for yes, me, I think I, I think for me, the industry really needs to move uh, move closer to using the actual operational data and using that in in designing of our heat networks, such that uh, we are we are um, sort of capitalizing on uh, use of uh, assets such as thermal store better, so that we are not installing too many assets. Um, there should also be some uh, in the regulations coming forward in the future. There should be some considerations about the acceptance criteria uh, of heat networks, such that. The operators are not set up to fail from from day one, um, and and some strict uh, strict uh, checklist or check uh, requirements around the acceptance of the heat network should also be brought in. Um, and finally, I think the the heating and billing regs in the future should be also considering more accurate billing for our end customers, um, which will which will basically force the industry to keep those AMR systems uh, up and running much more uh, better than what they are now. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, two points from me. So if anybody that's listening uh, has got ideas, wants to share anything that, that might be helpful to uh, decarbonisation of existing networks, please get in touch. Uh, you can find me on, on LinkedIn. We're always happy to uh, look at different ideas. Um, and secondly, and I know hands on the case or bays are on the case, but let's address this inequality that exists between gas and electricity. Otherwise, we are not going to decarbonise our heat network. And on that note, let's leave it there. Thank you so much to all our speakers. Please can everyone give them a round of applause. Even if we can't hear you, it's much appreciated. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining and see you at another Power Hour another time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.